you very much for attending uh, tonight. Uh, we have a really good show. And I am going to actually share my PowerPoint now, so that way you'll you'll get to see that. Welcome to the July 13th British Empire Study Group. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome in your into it for a tree. Uh, we're usually not this usually not this technically de deficient, but uh, I tried something. Now for our show tonight is Dr. Darren. And he's going to talk to us about the future of digital philately. And I am going to turn it over to my co-host, Robert Lunis, to do the introductions. Thank you very much, Robert. Thanks so much, Joan. When sociologists study technology adoption, philately is seen as one of the final frontiers. We are a hobby clutching onto traditions, but a new generation of philatelists is beginning to emerge. These collectors seek to embrace modern technologies to enhance their enjoyment of philately by applying contemporary skills to a traditional hobby. Dr. Darren Chernichen will take us into the exciting new world of digital philately, where he's been very successful in developing digital techniques to identify subtle differences among issues and varieties. Dr. Darren Chernichen is an avid philatelist. His main philatelic interest is limited to the one, two, and three cent Canadian small queens issues of the late 19th century. He's a member of the British Columbia Philatelic Society, the Fraser Valley Philatelic Stamp Club, and the West Toronto Stamp Club. He's the chair of the Digital Philately Study Group, as well as the chair of the Large and Small Queens Study Group of the British North American Philatelic Society. He serves on the membership committee of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada, also serves as the Canadian Director of the Northwest Federation of Stamp Clubs and is the editor of the Federation's journal, The Federated Philatelist. His society memberships include the Philatelic Specialist Society of Canada, the British North America Philatelic Society, the Canadian Philatelic Society of Great Britain, the Postal History Society of Canada, the American Philatelic Society, the Great Britain Philatelic Society, Rotary on Stamps, the American Topical Association, and the Ukrainian Philatelic and Numismatic Society. He's an avid outdoorsman, husband, father, and grandfather, and in his spare time looks after his acreage while running a medical practice. Okay, so without further ado, our presenter for this evening, Dr. Darren Chernichen. Well, thanks very much, Robert. I uh, am ready to start the presentation. Um, I just want to thank Joan uh, for the opportunity to uh, 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 present to you today. Um, uh, some of you may have heard me talk about digital philately, um, and I really want to uh, um, uh, share with you, um, and as I was speaking earlier to both Joan and Robert, um, what I want to do for you today is provide you with a, uh, I'm using a, a wide canvas with a thin layer of paint. Uh, um, metaphorically, to give you a sense of, of where we're going uh, with our hobby. So thank you for the warm introduction, Robert. And uh, I'm going to uh, basically start with what most of us had in the 1960s and 70s. I'm born in 63. So this is our, um, uh, my, my mom and dad's uh, encyclopedia set called the World Book. And that was my connection to the world. It was either, you know, Walter Cronkite or the CBC National News or PBS. And that would come in at a certain time. And if you didn't, if you weren't tuned in, you would miss it. You would then go to the newspaper. Um, but if you wanted to access information at home, this was the only way you could do it. And it was already curated for you. So if you could find it, great. And if you did find it, that information was limited to what was in the book itself. My parents went and then purchased the Encyclopedia Britannica because uh, uh, they stopped having children at, 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 with two children so they could afford maybe the, the, the up, and, up and coming Encyclopedia Britannica. So uh, it enhanced our ability to uh, find information at home. And that was it. That's all I had available to research the world except when it came to Archie books and comic books. And at the back of 
Archie books, you would see ant farms for sale and sea monkeys, otherwise known as brine shrimp. And so these big ads would catch a young person's attention. We didn't have um, uh, smartphones or anything like that. This was our connection to the real, real world. And at the back, you'd also see these types of advertisements. Uh, 314 stamps for 25 cents, or you can get iron curtain stamps um, guaranteed to be worth more than $2. And all you have to do is enclose 25 cents and you get a free booklet and all these other things about how to start stamp collecting. And then here's one at the back of a, um, a, a comic book. And if you look here, all those ones with arrows are all the ones that are related to stamps and almost invariably you would find um, uh, approvals. Uh, and this is the way these stamp companies, they would, they would hook you. They would give you some free stamps or 49 different stamps for 10 cents or a banana stamp from Tonga, which I still have. Um, and uh, uh, that's how you'd get hooked into stamp collecting, spending all your allowance. But I decided that this was the ad that hooked me. Uh, that, this, is, this is the ad that would hook me into stamp collecting because not only would I get 212 stamps from every corner of the earth. I would also get a stamp album and a booklet on how to collect postage stamps and a watermark detector and hinges and a magnifying glass from the Littleton Stamp Company in Littleton, New Hampshire. And I, I got I did send away for this and I still have all those little um, um, things in a box somewhere at home. So this is how I started. I had a Time World Atlas. I had my Littleton uh, stamp album and posted stamps and some stamp tongs. My parents were quite intrigued with my initiative so that um, within uh, a short period of time, I um, was given for Christmas the Ambassador album by H.E. Harris, the Denison folded stamp hinges and, and this book that was only $2, which I think is still the best uh, Canadian stamp um, uh, uh, catalog. Um, it's called Canada Stamps and Stories. And if you ever get a hold of it, it is an amazing, amazing little book. So my first human being that I actually spoke to, um, um, not online or over the phone, but was with with approvals. Um, and I had, he was like a pen pal for me and a mentor from Sarnia, Ontario. I, I'm from the west coast of British Columbia, a town of Ch um, in Chilliwack, BC, uh, about an hour out of Vancouver. Um, so this fellow from Sarnia, Ontario, sent me my first Canadian stamps on approval and was really my first personal relationship with a real stamp collector. And I didn't know what to collect. So what you're seeing there is basically the types of stamps that I started to collect from Canada. It was very quick that I realized that this issue um, from the early 1900s appealed to me only because of the color. And, and this uh, um, definitive series uh, showed to me that really color is something that attracts to me attracts me as as a stamp collector, and these are stamps I acquired from Julius Orosky. But it was shortly thereafter that I really became intrigued with the one, two, and three cent small queens, and that's really the focus of my adult uh, collection. So what did I do, and what did we all do as stamp collecting? If you're from my era or earlier or around that time, you'd go to department stores while your parents shopped. They would jump, dump you off at the stamp shop. And in Canada, we had Simpson Sears, Eaton's, Woodward's, the Hudson's Bay, and Woolworth's. And then there were stamp shops in every town. There was the Stanley Stamp Company, Crawford Coin and Stamps, and F.E. Eaton and Sons in, in, in the Vancouver area. And I grew up in Coquitlam, and we had the Centennial Stamp Club on Saturday mornings for the juniors, and then, then there was a week, the weekly uh, weeknight um, event for the adults, but I would go to the junior club, and that's really where, uh, that was my only, this was, this was my um, uh, connection to the stamp world, that and through Julius Orosky, and that was it. I went to university for 13 years, uh, Simon Fraser, University of British Columbia in McGill, Montreal. And I put my stamps in a box uh, up until about 30 years ago. And once the university ended, stamps slowly resurfaced to my consciousness in the 1990s. I purchased this book from Ryan Grant Duff. And I realized uh, at the time, Ron was still alive, Ron Ribbler. And uh, he became the adult version of my Julius Orosky. And then he basically fed me 
with uh, a plethora of, of stamps that really appealed to me, which is basically those one, two, and three cent small queens. So let's talk about digital philately. We went from basically a very basic way of, of finding information. I didn't include the library, but that would be a resource as well. And um, but as the computer age started, we you know are familiar with the Commodore 64, and before that we had computer rooms in classroom settings. My entire we had one entire room uh, with computer cards uh, at our high school. Then it went to a laptop, and then now we have the smartphone. And so within a matter of 30, 40 years, we've gone from no one having a computer at home um, to having a, a, com a computer in our hand that's even more powerful than any spaceship that was uh, uh, sent into space before 1980. So the smartphone and social media, is this the death knell for the next generation of philatelists? Is it? Uh, and what I mean by this is, is the smartphone taking potential newcomers to the hobby uh, and distracting them from becoming philatelists. And I think there is an argument to say yes. Uh, I think uh, most of us, when we started stamp collecting, uh, started at a young age. Um, and I sh shared you with, with how I became a stamp collector. And I'm sure that sh story is similar amongst many of you um, uh, in attendance this evening. Um, but I would argue that the uh, smartphone and social media are not the death knell um, for philatelists for the next generation. In fact, I think is a, a port of entry. Um, and I think if we uh, approach uh, and be creative enough with, with our um, tools that we have, our next generation of philatelists will be well equipped to uh, carry the hobby further over the next century. Um, so it is a platform. And this platform I'm going to talk about um, now. In 2020, the world shut down, but not for philatelists. Uh, COVID really shut the door on everything. And, and in 2020, in June, um, you'll see here that the Wall Street Journal did an article on why stamp collecting is suddenly back in vogue. People have time at home again. And, and it's interesting here that is sparking the interest of millennials, stamp collecting. Um, also, the Evening Standard uh, talked about uh, COVID lockdowns fueling demand for stamp collecting. And then Forbes also in that in, in March of 2020, this is like a month and a half once, once we really knew what COVID was about. COVID-19 virus affects the stamp market. And, uh, and, and I think most of us know that, that auction houses have done very well in the last few years um, because of, of the COVID virus and uh, how it's uh, taken, um, how it's impacted uh, philately from that perspective. Also, um, a hobby that sticks, and I find this an interesting quote in these days, is stamp collecting keeps people glued during pandemic. We never want to glue your stamps. You want to hinge them. So I'll just say stamp collecting keeps people hinged, not unhinged, during the pandemic. Um, and But something else happened during the pandemic. Um, and this meeting, for example, is, is, is a result of that. We've connected like never before, and we're basically collaborating and sharing information um, like never before. Um, and now enter the world of digital philately. And this is all accelerated thanks in part to COVID-19 because we're able to share our, our discoveries and our, our, our approaches to the hobby. So what is digital philately in the definition? The definition is the use of computing technologies, basically any hardware or any software related to computing to enhance the overall personal and shared experiences regarding the study of postage stamps and postal history. This is my definition of digital philately. I'm uh, uh, quite happy to uh, explore this definition um, because it's important to have a definition, a foundation. And I think this uh, definition is broad enough that it really um, anyone in the audience today is a digital philatelist. It's a non-specific -speci uh, genre. Um, you don't have to be a Canadian um, 19th century philatelist. Um, you can be a philatelist of any type um, and affects every aspect of the hobby. So what are the applications? Um, you could use digital philately as a tool to expand club and society memberships, exhibiting, 
research, selling, trading, organizing collections, writing articles and publishing, sharing, collaboration, presentation, and census bureaus. Um, these are just a, a handful of, of, of key applications that we see in this area of philately. So the tool to expand club and society memberships. So you can use um, um, the computer to uh, promote local stamp, club, stamp clubs. And if you Google the West Toronto Stamp Club afterwards, you can just write this down. They are a very good example of the use of digital applications to promote the hobby, to uh, encourage membership and to get people excited and collaborate. Regional societies such as the British North American Philatelic Society, Pacific and Northwest Regional Group. So it's a, it's a group of uh, philatelists um, uh, in the Pacific Northwest that uh, get together on a regular basis. National, international organizations uh, all use um, uh, digital philately as a way of connecting. Um, and Zoom is the biggest strength. Um, Zoom's biggest strength is its biggest weakness. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll say it for two reasons. Um, over, and I think we're not Zooming as much in the last uh, year or so, but there was a degree of Zoom fatigue and complacency. And if we are too comfortable in our um, T-shirts and underwear while we're watching these uh, presentations, it becomes uh, a bit difficult sometimes to reconnect into those bricks and mortar um, uh, um, establishments that we are used to in the past. I think it's important that we um, embrace both. Uh, youth membership is another way of, of getting people connected with social media forums, mentorship, and uh, the digital philatelist, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, here is a, uh, um, uh, an example of the West Toronto Stamp Club's homepage. Um, and they have things such as discussion groups and learning workshops and, and club exhibitions. And, and it is really a, a wonderful website. And you could use it, I think, as a template uh, to, for your own stamp club. Uh, the Digital Philatelist um, is really a platform for um, um, modern stamp collectors uh, who really want to um, um, uh, hear about different aspects of uh, stamp collecting, um, not just um, countries and themes. And it, there's a lot of really good presentations on this website, and it's it really can open up your eyes to things that you never thought people did when they collect stamps. So this is a very good uh, website. And here are some of the things that I've highlighted about it. You can join, they have a great Facebook page. They encourage youth and beginners. Um, they have a great news page. They have uh, a link to what's called the Punk Philatelist. And I would encourage you to check out the Punk Philatelist, really thinking outside of the box when it comes to philately. Um, a friend of mine, Ken Pugh, has a Facebook page uh, called Ken Pugh Stamp Forgeries. And this is an incredibly interesting uh, forum uh, of 1,600 members that it's a public um, uh, community that anyone can join. And uh, this is a wonderful way of connecting and Facebook is, is a great platform for that. Um, exhibiting. Um, Digital exhibiting is really important this day and age. Um, and there, for a variety of reasons, people are not comfortable, uh, some people aren't, uh, sending their um, uh, decades worth of material that they've collected and uh, shipping it off to another country with the hope that it'll come back intact and uh, undamaged. Um, there are a number of uh, uh, exhibit, uh, exhibits that are available online, the American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors, not only mentors and, and uh, shows how to exhibit, but they also have a great digital exhibit uh, website, and uh, which I'm showing you here. Um, it's phenomenal, actually. And, uh, and so you just have to go to the American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors, go to their um, um, tab page on the left there, click on exhibiting, and you'll find a whole host of wonderful exhibits. ExpoNet is another uh, really good uh, uh, online exhibition site. Um, and the, uh, the great thing about that is they have, have at this point in time over a thousand philatelic exhibits. You can search what you're looking for and um, the, the quality of the material is, is phenomenal. The uh, stamp on the web uh, is a portal of philately by the AICPM. And you'll see here 
all the different types of, 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 of clubs and organizations that are contributing to this uh, stamp on the web. Uh, the BNAPs, ExpoNet, uh, Canadian Philatelic Society, you can see all the visitors all over the world. Um, th what's interesting about this one, it's not the US that is the um, most prevalent of the visitors, it's, it's, they are Italians. And, and this is an Italian site that uh, has an English language component to it. The content of this site is really good. Research. So when it, oops, when it comes to researching, there are several things that we can do um, from our homes. We can online resources, home tools, um, highly specialized tools and census bureaus. So let's talk about home tools. And most of us have at least one of these things right now at our home. We have a scanner in our house, an Epson Perfection V600 photo. It is an incredibly inexpensive, about two, $300 for this scanner. And you can actually scan postage stamps at 24,000 DPI. Uh, you don't need it that high, but if you're really interesting and do, interested in dots and scratches like I am, that is an incredibly good scanner and it really matches color beautifully. Digital microscopes are available and this is a great way of sharing information as well as if you're looking at a lot of stamps, your eyes can get tired very quickly. And if, if you're not keen on putting stamps under a scanner, digital microscope is quite useful and there are many available. Uh, the iPhone 13 and now the 14 has have macro lens technologies, and I'm going to show you examples of, of the types of images that you can get from an iPhone um, a camera. And software, Photoshop, lower Adobe versions, uh, free editors with Windows, PowerPoint, Keynote with Mac, Gwydion, which I'm going to talk about, photogrammetry. And you can get stamp collection databases or create your own. You can get out of the box ones. Uh, that are specialized. Um, you can uh, use Excel or equivalent and make up your own database, which I have done. And I also have um, uh, a program called Easy Stamp, which um, is not terribly intuitive, but once you get a hang of it, it is really a powerful tool. So these are research home tools. So here's the Epson scanner. That's the exact scanner I have at home. And there is an example of the small queen that I collect. But if you look at the iPhone that I own, I own an iPhone 13. There is a; these are all three pictures of a 1860 or 1967 Canada five cent stamp, and I would argue that um, that th the images here are pretty darn good. Uh, this is you cannot really visually see a lot of these dots within the naked eye, and this in normal um, light, the, the, this. This is a normal kitchen lamp or, or chandelier. There was no special lighting required for these photographs. Gwydion uh, is a freeware that allows you to, and it's really good for engraved stamps, and most stamps before 1940 are engraved. And you will see that if you're a collector of stamps before 1940, Gwydion is a great feature. And you'll be able to identify where the arrows are showing little nicks and plates and everything else. And if you're wanting to help date stamps or look at how plates wore over the time of the of the issue this is a really really good feature and it also offers some other interesting tool tools that i'm going to show you so gwydion by definition is the druid of the gods in wealth mythology a wise god master of illusion and that i think that's why it's called gwydion helper of humankind so we're basically helping philatelists um, uh, help philatelists and fighter against the greedy and the small minded and supported the cultural arts and learning, uh, try to stamp out ignorance. So um, it's Gwydion.net and I encourage you to go to it and I'll show you what how, how to uh, access it in just a moment. It's a modular program for scanning probe microscopy data. It's a very powerful software. It, it analyzes height fields, grayscale, leveling and filtering or grain marking fun functions. So the height fields are great for embossed or engraved stamps. The grayscale is able to see things the magnification alone cannot. You can identify overlays in terms of cancellations, overprints, which, which cancellation went on first. It was, it, did the overprint come on after or before the cancellation in terms of whether something's legitimate or not. And also for paper analysis in terms of grain markings. So you go to Gwydion.net, 
And then you'll see there the download um, icon on the left-hand column. So you click download and that's what you get. You see either the Mac OS or the MS Windows. So if you're a Mac person, um, it's not as good. Uh, but if you're a Windows person, Gwydion is, is really designed for you. I'm both a Mac and Windows person, so I get the best of the both worlds. But if, but really for this purpose, it's MS Windows, Microsoft Windows. So the key to Gwydion is keeping it simple. You can be overwhelmed. It's like a cockpit in an airplane. You just really know where the thought, where all you need to know is where to, where the thought only uh, is and where to steer. <laughs> So don't feel overwhelmed by all the icons. You just click File, Open, and select a stamp from your image library. So you go to File, here's Open, and I, I, clicked, I clicked on a two-cent stamp um, uh, from my library. So I clicked Open, and then it shows you the physical dimensions of the stamp. And then I clicked OK. So now it's in Gwydion, and each window of Gwydion is its own workspace. And what I do is I open a third a third workspace window to display a 3D view of the data. And so what I do is I click that little green uh, angled square, and that opens a 3D view of the data. And so instantly, it identifies that this is an engraved stamp, and it provides a 3D image of the stamp, which can be is quite cool. And you'll see how this technology helps you at the end of the, the this little um, exercise. So that's what you get on the 3D value. And I'm giving you a, 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 an example of what it looks like up close. So, and then what happens is that you can actually uh, um, adjust uh, your, your settings using this little um, green uh, box, which you're basically expanding on this. And so what you're doing is you're using a scale view as a whole. So I'm basically walking you through the cockpit of this aircraft so that you don't crash the plane and still get to the end of the um, runway. So the you're going to enlarge your image by opening and clicking on scale view as a whole. And then you place your cursor over the image workspace. You left click, hold and drag, and voila, this thing really becomes big. And by doing so, and that's where you can you, where you do this here, and and I'm showing you where where to where to make that click. Uh, it's a few little steps, very intuitive. Uh, once you uh, do it once or twice, and um, but this is really the the platform to help you along. And so then what you do here is that you'll see this little green back forth arrow that basically sends you back to your reverted image of where where you started from. So you can go back and forth to your 3D image and to your basic image using that little uh, back and forth arrow. You go to lighting is the next thing. And lighting is an important aspect of Gwydion. And so as soon as you click on lighting, you get this sort of spectral look. And now the software is starting to do things. And then what you're going to do is you're going to basically change the light source direction. What you're doing now is moving a pinpoint source of light. If you're looking down on the stamp, you can actually make this pinpoint of light from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, from the northwest, from high above, from low. And so what you're doing is the lower you have your light from an angle, the more shadows you're going to get from an engraved stamp, which is really quite cool. It's going to bring out the engraving. And so when you have it at 67 degrees and 61 degrees, light up and uh, and um, um, from the angle, then you start seeing a really interesting view of the stamp. And then this scale view, uh, you scale it to see the whole icon again. So what you're doing is you're expanding the stamp to make it bigger. So you go from a you go from a smaller stamp to a bigger stamp. Now my favorite part of this is selecting color. So you see material there. I like OpenGL default colors, pearl or pewter. And now you get to really see really almost what the engraver saw before they inked the, the plates. And here you go with an overlay and make any light adjustments. So what I did is I used silver and then I overlaid it with gray. And so now what I've done, and it's really quite simple. You just have to click overlay and, and identify your color and you really start to see this stamp in a three-dimensional view. 
and you can zoom in and it's quite amazing. You can really identify plate varieties so beautifully here. And you can actually watch, if you have dated copies, you can actually watch um, uh, issues as, as the plate fades and gets broken. Uh, you can see this very clearly on uh, using Gwydion. Another example of Gwydion is to enhance the color that you can't see. For example, the three, if you look at the stamp on the, on the left, the original stamp, you really can't see the date very well. But once you use Gwydion, that three pops up under, um, underneath and uh, in, in, in the middle part of the lower part of the stamp, that three really pops up nicely. The red three is, is, is a, um, an overlay just to show you where to look. But that three really pops up nicely with Gwydion. This is a really cool example, courtesy of uh, Robert Colson. He um, passed away a year ago. Um, and Robert really introduced me to Gwydion. Uh, he uses this example to show you that a Scott 139 surcharge was actually uh, looking for a double surcharge was a fake because you see here that the cancel is actually over the surcharge um, and or I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the, the surcharge is over the cancel. So there's actually three things you're looking at, the original surcharge, the cancel, and then the, the faked double surcharge. And Gwydion helps identify that for people. It's really quite cool. Um, and this is the last example of Gwydion looking um, at a, a very nice example of another engraved stamp um, showing the little pitting that you see on the plates, uh, illustrated quite nicely. The next thing I want to talk about is photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is another philatelic uh, application. And it really, most of us are familiar with it. Um, and, uh, and in the middle of the 19th century, almost simultaneously with the appearance of photography itself, people developed photographs using topographic maps um, proposed by the French surveyor Dominique Arago in about 1840. The term photogrammetry was coined by the Prussian architect um, Albrecht um, Maidenbauer, which appeared in his 1867 article, Die Photometrography. Photometrography. The 19th century uses were stereo plotters to plot contour lines on topographic maps and also photographers to give a 3D photography. And many of you in antique shops have seen these um, uh, double um, um, uh, pane uh, photographs. Like when, when inserted into this little device, you get to see a 3D image. And this is a really cool one, the Chateau de Diable. Um, and that's an example. But what's interesting is that digital philately um, really can be defined as variants of photogrammetry. Simon Cronk from Victoria, Australia has this website, photogrammetry.com.au slash stamps. And it's really a philatelic stereoscope analyzing the two sides of a stereo card for our purposes, two similar postage stamps. So here's a demonstration. So now I want to do this on a mass scale and and really what I'm I'm at the actual stage now where I can do this. So I, the reward is not being off, offered anymore, but I will reward you by being able to help you uh, do this. And, and, and a, um, a new upcoming um, newsletter uh, in BNA Topics is an article I'm writing about uh, describes how I went about doing this. Um, and, and if you can think about this, um, this is the photogrammetry uh, website. And what you're doing is your exemplar, you're uploading an exemplar, which is your, your stamp that your comparators, your basically your, your, um, your main stamp that you're using as a reference. So it's your exemplar is your reference stamp. And then what you do is you, if you'll notice at the four corners of the image of the stamp is a green uh, um, hash mark, a red hash mark in the upper right, a blue hash mark in the lower left and a yellow hash mark in the lower right. And these are the four critical hash marks that what you're doing is you're you're mapping out where the image is on the stamp with your exemplar. And then you've done that. Then you click on candidate and you and the candidates on the right hand side side here and you do the same thing with the candidate. And then what you do is in the center you click on toggle and then you there's a toggle line under the under the word toggle and you make sure you click on blend and now you can see different things happening you're 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 shifting back and forth to the stamp where it is right now you're seeing an overlay of both stamps but if you're looking for something in terms of is the stamp wider 
Is it longer? Is the image, is there, are there defects in the image? You can actually use these comparisons very nicely. And so photogrammetry is great when you're, when you're comparing an exemplar to a candidate stamp. Now, other examples of digital philately are online resources, such as the Institute of Analytical Philately, the IAP. Um, I know Richard Judge well from this institute. Um, uh, Bill Burden's web space, WGB's web space is a great um, um, resource for Canadian stamps, um, but you could use it for anything else. It's, 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 it's a good template. Uh, you should see Bill Burden's uh, website. I'll show give you an example of that in a second. Dave Hobden from Ontario um, is really an expert in, in identifying free maps online. And mapping is very important in philately. And um, a variety of universities throughout the world have map departments that are online and you can access maps for free. You can also do philatelic storytelling uh, with Ancestry and newspapers.com. So here's Bill Burden's site. And, um, and basically, it, it's his web uh, space, and I really encourage you to, to visit his website. It really brings uh, digital philately to a new, for, um, new forefront. I'm not going to explain it because I want you to go to his site. Um, here uh, is a, an example of what he is able to do. He has mapped out small queens, for example, and each of the small queens has a certain area or a, an anatomical uh, part, so a 2R or a um, 2R1, 2R3, 2R11, he defines what those are, and then he basically can identify and he categorizes and organizes and files constant plate varieties. And this could be done with any type of stamp, and using Bill's um, uh, template would be a very good um, way to uh, inspire you if you're interested in, in creating a website uh, for varieties. So for example, this is how he defines this particular stamp. It's a lower latent reentry, and the stamp is called 2R3.1. Um, it's a wonderful and earliest um, uh, use date and late, latest use date. So there's a lot of information you can get from this. And, um, and Bill has done a wonderful job of uh, the admirals and the small queens. What interests me as well is storytelling and genealogy and philately, and the world is li literally at our fingertips. And I'm gonna give you an example, and keep in mind the length of time that it takes me to, to tell you this little story is the length of time it took me to actually get the story. So it only took me about 15 minutes to establish all the information you're about to see in just a moment. I pulled out a small queen cover from my box of small queens, and this is a, um, a double letter rate, two cent small queen cover. It origined in May uh, in Niagara, Canada West in 1883. It, it was received on the same day in Woodstock, Ontario, not far away, uh, a few miles away. And it was the addressee, I, I, it's hard to read, but I thought maybe Francis Gale Esquire, county attorney. The, the letter was reduced on the right-hand side, um, mailed to Woodstock, Ontario. And so what I wanted to do is learn more about this um, uh, fellow, but, but I'm going to let you know why I purchased this cover in the first place. It's because I'm a dots and scratches guy. And if you look at the middle stamp and the bottom underneath the left two, you'll notice that there is a, um, a plate scratch. And so that's why I bought this cover. So in summary, what I'm able to get so far just by looking at the stamp is the origin and the receiver and the addressee. On the back of the cover uh, is a Woodstock receiver and, and some illegible scribble at the bottom. And there's some information here at the top. Is it Hosaku and Stauffer? Um, or is it how how uh, how second it, it could be because it's sent to a lawyer and this could be a a, a, a claim um, the plaintiff and the defendant. So here we go. I'm going to go and use these search terms. I think it's Francis Bale, County Attorney, Woodstock, Ontario, Niagara, 1883, Stauffer. That's really what I can come up with. So those are my search terms. And I'm gonna to go to Ancestry. I'm from Canada, so this is ancestry.ca. Many of you are from the US, and so you can use 
ancestry.com or whatever ancestry service that you have available. You can have a monthly service, a half year or a full year. They offer free trials, but keep in mind that if you do offer, go ahead with the free trial, for example, a 14 day free trial, if on day 15, you'll be charged for the full year. So if you're not happy, get unload it on day 13. The all access ancestry is, ancestry is cool. Um, not only do you have ancestry, you have newspapers.com and you have military records primarily from the US. So I remember those search words that I used. I went Francis, Bale, Woodstock, and that's all I entered in my search for ancestry. That's it. And here's what I came up with. I found in 1891 a Francis Ball. Remember I thought it was Bale, but it actually comes with Francis Ball and there's the 1891 census from Oxford North. So this is the right area of Canada and Ontario. So I clicked on that census information and voila, I hear, I see the census page and this is an interpreted view of that handwritten census. Francis Ball, male, married 53, born in 1828. He's Presbyterian. He's a barrister. So I think I'm right on with this. And his subdistrict is Woodstock. And in 1881, he's 53 years old. So, and then if I scroll down on that page, I get to see who's in his household. And there, aside from William Allen and Mary Wagner, there is a large ball contingent of family members. So I'm what, what, what intrigues me is who's Agnes and why is she eight years older than all these other kids? I don't think Agnes was eight when she had Andrew. So uh, I'm inquiring about what's happening here. So I go then to the deaths uh, 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 records of Francis Ramsey Ball. And here it is. Here's Francis's um, death rec uh, certificate uh, entered into the uh, uh, county of Oxford, Woodstock. And um, you'll see that Francis uh, died on January 27, 1913 in Niagara at 219 Van Sittert Avenue. He was a barrister and at the time of his death was a widower. And in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that he died of gangrene of the left leg for 11 days uh, before he passed on. So now I know his name, I'm going to re uh, refine my search and, and use now exact search criteria. I didn't use exact before, but now I'm using Francis Ramsey Ball, and that's exact search criteria in Ancestry. And now I get even more defined information. I know that his birth date is not 1828. It's actually November 5th, 1827. And indeed, he died on January 27th, as it was stated on his death uh, certificate. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I want to learn more about this guy. So it said initially 1828. So I'm going to click on plus or minus a year um, so that any Francis Ramsey Ball that was born uh, in 1827, 28 or 29 will appear. And this is what I get. I not only get um, this information about his death death uh, information, I, I save that in a thing called a shoebox. I'm going to click on uh, his marriage information because I'm wondering, when did he get married with all those kids? And so it shows that he was married on June the 22nd, 1870, at the age of 42. And, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, this is his spouse is Agnes Barter. And um, and so who is this person and did she provide children for him in their marriage? And so here is their marriage certificate on arrow dot. So it's on the left hand column. And you'll see here that uh, Francis at the time of his uh, marriage was a widower and he married Agnes, who was 22, 20 years is younger. And remember, Francis was born in Niagara and he married uh, someone from Niagara. So maybe this was someone who was a um, uh, made to order bride to help him with his children after his wife died. So uh, at this uh, marriage, uh, he was of the Free Church and she was of the Church of England. And so here are the public archives, microfilmed in 1955, uh, back going in the personal census. And you'll see here in the, in the uh, um, uh, district or the town of Otterville, uh, you'll see Francis's immediate family, and those are the people that live in his home. Uh, Francis, his uh, um, wife, and uh, four children. This is his original family um, before his wife passed on. 
And you'll see here that uh, there is his wife who was 25. So he's only, he's eight years older than his wife. And at the time he was 33, they had uh, a, a little uh, boy and a little girl, a younger girl called Isabella, uh, ages two and one respectively at that time of the census. So now that I see where Otterville is, and it says it's outside of the limits of the district, um, I look here. And so all I did is on my maps um, uh, uh, feature of my iPhone, I went to Norfolk County, I searched that and, 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 and there it was, and I zoomed in and lo and behold, outside of the city of, of the county limits in Southern Ontario is a little town called Otterville as I zoomed, uh, zoomed in. And so that's where he lived. Close to Norfolk County, part of the census lived in Otterville. Now that I know when he died, I went into newspapers.com and checked the obituary. And lo and behold, he died on the 27th, but on the 28th of, of, of January, the day after he died, in the Montreal Gazette, hundreds, several hundred miles away, was the obituary. This is quite incredible, in my, my opinion, that within a day of his death, uh, it's not only the information is, is sent to the Montreal Gazette, but it's already published uh, in the Quebec uh, newspaper. This is a copy of that obituary record. And um, what's interesting, if you look here, uh, it's Francis Ramsey Ball. But if you look at the bottom of it, it says the deceased kept a diary, largely his own experience, partly furnished from recollections supplied by his parents and uh, of the uh, military and political history of the province of Ontario for the last hundred years. So not only am I finding more about this lawyer, I'm finding that he actually kept a really cool diary. So all I did was search Francis Ramsey Ball Diary in Microsoft Bing, which is a general search engine, and I found 4.6 million hits. But the second hit that came up was the Ball Family History Manuscript, which is the one that was described in his obituary. And so if you click on that, lo and behold, you get over 15 pages of that diary typed up uh, from Francis Ball about his family and about military history in Ontario, which is really quite amazing. And this is the last page of that written by Francis Ramsey Ball, Woodstock, Ontario. So this certainly is the fellow. And so Ramses, uh, um, Francis Ramsey Ball, that cover, I was able to use ancestrynewspapers.com and a basic internet search focusing on his diary to come up with this summary of his life. This is all in 15 minutes. Francis Ramsey Ball for 40 years was the Crown Attorney for the County of Oxford in Woodstock, Ontario. I didn't show you all the things I found, but this is, this is what I found. He was one of approximately 50 Queen's Council appointees in the province during this period. He was born in Niagara on November 27th or 25th, 1827 to William and Margaret Ball of Scottish descent. He was married twice and outlived his wives, both of whom died relatively young. He lived on a farm in Otterville, 15 miles southeast of Woodstock, had three children from his first marriage and was a member of the Free Church. He remarried at, uh, at age 42 to Agnes, also from Niagara, 20 years his junior. He had four more children with Agnes. Francis became a member of the Presbyterian Church of Canada upon marrying Agnes. They were married for 18 years before she died at the age of 40. He was a reformist and, a narrowly, and was narrowly defeated by one vote in the provincial election. After suffering 11 days of gangrene on the left leg, Francis died on January 27, 1913 at the age of 85 at his home on 219 Van Sittard Avenue in Woodstock. From, uh, for some time prior to his death, Francis suffered from senile decay. The original house no longer remains on Google Maps. I was able to determine that that house no longer exists. But there are other old uh, Victorian style homes on that street. He kept a diary highlighting the military and political history of Ontario from the 18th and 19th centuries, from the accounts oral history of his grandfather and father. Family and personal stories are also shared on in this 30 page narrative. The diary rests in the Ontario government archives. So all that from a cover I randomly pulled out of a box because I thought the second stamp was cool because it had uh, a plate error. Other things in digital philately, selling, trading, organizing collections, writing articles, publishing, sharing, collaboration, presentations, census bureaus. So the British North America Philatelic Society, for example, uh, has censuses of early covers and cancels. Many other organizations have the same thing. And censuses are great ways of collaborating with your material 
And this way, if you only have one or two pieces, it can add incredibly important data uh, for Wayne Smith's, for example, uh, census on early covers and cancels of, of, of early period Canadian um, philatelic material. That is it. Thank you for your attention. But before I do this, I'm going to now get out of this. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to show you a little sneak preview of where I am with one of my digital philately techniques. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to now start sharing again of this. What is this one here? I'm going to start. Oops, I'm going to click out of that and I'm going to share the screen. Here we go. What I want to show you here is that I have a technique that I scan um, my small queens a certain way, not based on the, the size of the stamp itself or by the perforations, but I scan it and plot it on a grid scale using PowerPoint so that the center of the stamp is basically the center of, of, the, uh, of, of the actual image of the stamp. And now I can actually use it as a flip chart to identify varieties very quickly without um, killing my vision. So I'm going to ask you to look at the, I'm going to zoom in here. I'm going to zoom in to the uh, eye of the queen. And I just want you to look at the queen's eye as I'm going to show you about 50 stamps. And you will see that the queen's eye is very different in all 50 stamps. Here we go. uh why isn't this working okay uh actually i'll do it this way i can't do it zoomed in so anyway here we go here is oh oh i have to up ah, i have to use the powerpoint presentation so here we go you can see the eye is different and i can do this at a glance and now i can actually become an expert on queen eyes of this particular stamp issue it's really quite amazing that I it would take me hours and hours to identify these variants of the eye, but now I can actually look at the eye and and behold find certain things that I didn't see before. It's really quite amazing, um, and so that's just a little sneak preview of where I'm at right now with my own digital philately work. So um, I'm going to stop sharing. I want to thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention and. And uh, and for the uh, once again, Joan, for the invitation, and I hope I've uh, inspired people to use their computer and their technology that they already have at home. Oh, thank you so much, Doctor. That was a wonderful presentation with a lot of things to think about. Um, one of the one of our uh, viewers, Jack Gringless, asks: Is there a digital way to identify color shades? There is, and Joan might have an answer for that one too. The thing is, is you have to realize that scanners scan, uh, each scanner scans color differently. And you really have to have a exemplar stamp and you really have to have, um, and so what you're gonna do is, is you need to have a collection of stamps that, are known by consensus with a collaboration. So it's a bit tricky at this time, but you have to then have, have okay, I have these particular five stamps of this issue, and these particular five stamps have these well-defined shades all in agreement. And so you scan those stamps, and then that becomes, those become your exemplars with your scanner and the way you've color matched it. You can't at this time compare other people's stuff unless they use the exact same mm -hmm. scanner with the exact same scanning functions um, and settings. Even then there may be differences in the age of the um, uh, a bulb that is used to scan the scanner um, and uh, the, the, how clean the, the, the glass is and, all, and, and what's behind the, uh, the, the you have to make sure that you have the exact same material behind the stamp every time. There's a lot of different things just for consistency to compare with other collectors and to compare to see if you have a particular shade. You can only compare with an exemplar in your own collection at this point. If someone has an idea to do so otherwise, that would be a great thing to know and to share. Excellent. 
um, are from Piyush Kaitan. He asks if there are any suggestions for a substitute for retro reveal. He understands that ah, their site is there available. is, and um, what I will do is I will give Joan retro reveal for those who don't know is a great way of of enhancing certain things such as postmarks and taking away things. It's basically what you're doing is you're taking a one dimensional item and you're you're making it into into various layers, just like you would when you're layering with Adobe, for example, and it does it for you with a one with a two dimensional stamp. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite incredible. Retro reveal for a period of time last year went went uh, was ghosted. It you couldn't access it, and then it resurfaced. And I will send Joan that link, and then you can put it on on the website uh, with my uh, presentation. There is a replacement. Thank you very much for that question. I decided not to use it because I didn't want to confuse people. But yes, retro reveal is a great tool, uh, especially for uh, um, uh, anyone who uh, collects, and you could use it for covers, you could use it for um, uh, not just individual stamps, you could use it for, uh, um, uh, but it's great for cancellations. Excellent. Chris Anstead asks, what software do you recommend for the idea of a tough postmark? The idea of a tough postmark? No, to, to ID a tough postmark. Oh, I would use Retro Reveal I would also use, well, the, the equivalent of Retro Reveal now and Gwydion. Gwydion is great. Um, and the nice thing about Gwydion is you can shade it so that it can, you can, and Retro Reveal, you can actually black black out, if, if for example, my orange three cent or my vermilion three cent small queen, I could pretty well eliminate all the color and just show the cancellation. And then, um, and it can also, and if there's a, a gray stamp, and a black cancel, and it's hard to see the two, um, Retro Reveal will completely eliminate uh, the stamp uh, image, just showing the uh, cancellation, which is a, a great thing. Um, and so I, I, I think at this point in time, Retro Reveal, Retro Reveal and Gwydion are the two that I use. All right. Uh, Giles Morell asks, can you talk to the digital measurement of perforations? Um, digital oh. Digital I actually wrote an article on this ah. and I'm going to just I'm going to that I, I didn't pay this person to ask the question, but I am going to give you my um, my hobbyist website. I don't make really any money from it. Um, it's really to share information and to, to share, share with my love of philately. My website is small queens, plural, small queens dot C.A. If you go there, I have three articles that I've posted. One is how to digitally perf using a scanner and Photoshop. You can also do it with any uh, um, uh, photo. Um, you don't have to have Photoshop, but you have to be able to use a um, scanning device or a scanning application that can actually measure in pixels. So if you can actually measure in pixels, then you can actually um, use that to to the one hundredth uh, accurately. The so you can actually go twelve point one four by twelve point one five on a on a perf. Now keep in mind that there is set, you, you can go to the, such a degree that the variation between each perf has a variation. So I actually do an average of ten perfs uh, over a stamp. Is is my is 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 the way I do it. But if you go to smallqueens.ca, you will actually have my published article on how to do digital perfing at home. All right. All right. Well, that takes care of all of the the Q and A that we've had listed here. Let's open it up to the audience for questions. Somebody hit the raise hand button, and we'll. Well, I hope it was helpful. Some of you may have heard this talk. I gave um, uh, this the bulk of this talk at KPEX in Toronto last year. And so I see a few familiar faces that were at that talk. Um, but I, I try to emphasize different things at, at this oh, particular talk. So uh, keeping the, that in mind for those people who've see, heard this talk a second time. This is the second time I've presented this. All right, Adrian Pearson, you've got a question. Yes. Um... 
I, I, collect, I collect and talk about Crimean War postal history, and that involves uh, British line engraved stamps. I'm never very good at plating. There's loads of books on it, and plate, plating can make a lot of difference in value for a start. Um, has anybody used these um, comparison techniques and comparison software to actually make plating easier? Let me, I actually can answer that, and then I invite anyone else um, in the audience to answer this as well. But Adrian, it's a really good question. Um, I think there are two ways that we can approach this. When it comes to plating, um, if you can actually get um, uh, resources of the actual plate proofs, um, and for example, um, uh, Jim Watt from Alberta and Hamilton, Ontario, has written a lovely book um, that was published last year. Um, and uh, this book actually shows the plating of each of the, uh, of a Queen Victoria issue, the two cent issue from uh, the, the Pence issue from the 1800s. And why I use this book as an example is because he looks at every single uh, um, image on of the two plates that were used and then highlights and in, 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 in basically enlarges each one of these as a single page in his book. What I am doing with the small queens is looking at it from a different angle. He went, he goes from the plate to the stamp. I'm going from the stamp to the plate. It's like basically what I'm doing is basically looking at, I'm having 30 different jigsaw puzzles with all the pieces that look exactly the same in a box of about 20,000 to 30,000 three cent small queens. And I'm scanning them and, I'm, and what I'm doing is I am identifying them anatomically. It's, it's an onerous task, but what the beauty of this onerous task is it's making me more efficient in things that I didn't know I needed to be efficient in. And then I'm sharing this information as I'm doing it. But as I'm learning about the platings of these stamps, then I can relate those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle to stuff that's already been available. And I can actually take chunks of these stamps. And then I know exactly when this stamp was um, plated, what issue. It, it's, it's a phenomenal thing. I'll be um, publishing this information in about 18 months time um, uh, with the, uh, the British North American Philatelic Society and also with the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada. Um, and I may actually publish uh, an article uh, in um, the, uh, um, uh, the the APS uh, um, journal. And, and, and the reason is because it's not just about Canadian stamps. It's not just about engraved stamps. It's really about how we can take one stamp and link it to the whole puzzle. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. It's a it's a onerous task, um, and I am a bit of a a, a, a re recluse in that regard, and and um, a bit of a hermit. And so when I'm I'm sick of dealing with people all day long, so sometimes I just stay at home and and shut the door and and play with my stamps and scan them and look at the same old stamp all day long. But my eyes don't go bad because I have it all scanned. So long winded answer, but. The thing is, is we are working on it. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Frank Shear, you have a question. Um, yes, not really a question, just a comment. Um, I'm not a philatelist, so I don't deal with stamps or variations or anything like that. Uh, I deal with uh, how mail moved and particularly by railway and highway post offices. Uh, but my ears perked up when you started talking about ancestry. Uh, I don't think a lot of people fully realize a lot of the external resources, and, and I think you went into that very well there, um, that are possible in researching a cover that goes beyond just what you see on the cover. Uh, you've got the sender, you've got the receiver, um, and uh, each of those sometimes uh, merges into the story about what that cover is. Uh, in particular, I like looking for instances where a railway postal clerk was the person who mailed a cover or a postmaster mailed a cover, and uh, Ancestry facilitates that research to go back to the postal postmaster appointment records or to the official register to uh, look at uh, who these 
railway postal clerks were and when they worked. So um, I think it was an excellent presentation. Um, and uh, I'll leave it to all the other people on here to, to uh, focus on how the different variations of Queen Victoria or whoever uh, her eyes are, um, because that's well beyond my uh, scope of interest or ability. Uh, but um, if anybody also wants some of the sample articles that I've written that have gone beyond just the postage stamp and the postal markings on a cover as examples, I'd be glad to uh, share them with them. So thank you very much, Darren. I'll go back to mute. Well, thanks, Frank. That's awesome. Frank, we'll get your information and we'll we'll put that on the site. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Paul Davey, do you have a question? Well, firstly, thank uh, thank Darren very much for a, a thought-provoking presentation. An awful lot of subjects covered that will take a bit of thinking about. But uh, an answer to the, the question about plating of line engraved Great Britain, so the penny black, penny red in particular, um, there is an effort underway to produce high resolution images of every stamp from each position on each plate of the penny red. It's on a, on a, a wiki website called stampftheworld.co.uk, which you can, you can look up. Um, there's tens of thousands of images there so far, but it's gonna take all collectors from all over the world, putting a few images in to actually get it complete. Um, that works by taking a, a high resolution scanned image and measuring the number of pixels, as you mentioned, um, to, to position the letters in all in the lower two corners, the penny red in Perth, um, and compare that with, with known data that's been measured in the published if, in the past. If I can if I can interrupt, Paul, you I before I lose my thought, um, what I wanted to share with you is that when you are comparing stamps and this is what i'm doing right now when i showed you the last thing where i did that little flip chart you really must center the image of the stamp not the stamp itself where you don't center the the, the actual paper of the stamp you actually center the image and and that is that center piece should be defined on every stamp and then every stamp that you have in your collection in your census gets overlaid from that exact point. And, and if you do it that way, you will then be able to see which stamps have are on certain paper, if it's wove, uh, horizontal or vertical, or any of those other types of things, because as the, pa as the paper dried, you might have a stamp that is more vertical or more horizontal. And if you pick a reference point at the top corner and work down, you'll have a mess. So the, the most important thing is, is, is when you're comparing these stamps, make sure that you've identified the exact center of the image, and that is the exact pinpoint where every other stamp is overlaid from. One thing the, the, the um, point, I'd like to point... uh, bring up is the uh, issue of scanning. And quite often, I don't think people uh, realize or understand scanners. The typical scanner that you have that out there, let's say under $500, there are definite issues with pixel to pixel placement. And uh, assuming it's an RGB, uh, there is definitely uh, non-uniformity issues from pixel to pixel in regards to the color response. Um, I, you know, I strongly suggest that people, uh, before uh, getting into detailed scanning efforts, look at the Library of Congress standards uh, for archival scans. Um, they're expensive. If you want a good scanner, you're talking about $4,000. Personally, what I use, I go to a local museum or something like that, who has an archival scanner to do the scans for me. But uh, people need to understand, uh, let's say that you're doing, uh, you know, the problem with uh, obviously with JPEG or PNG, you have interpolation. So you have interpolation issues on your final scan. So I, I, I 
most strongly suggest that people uh, get involved and, and need to understand uh, the, uh, the fundamentals of accuracies associated with pickles, pixels and their responses, uh, assuming uh, from a, a normal scanner to a, a high quality scanner. Uh, there's uh, a lot I, I of misinformation you're... in uh, in people doing scanning. I think Dale, what you're saying is really important because you're you're focusing on the limitations that all of us have at home that we'll never be able to overcome. Um, most of us are only have what's available in front of us within the dollar budget that we have, and so I think um, when we're dealing with uh, what Paul Davy was talking about. Uh, as it relates to the plating um, of the British stamps, the Queen Victoria stamps, you know, the Penny Reds, for example. Um, I think once you're able to get certain exemplars, you can actually take and, and scan those exemplars at very high level. But I think you can do enough raw data collection from people's scans and have them uh, send that in, into this database. You can get a ton, ton of information, but I do agree with you, Dale. To get accurate um, uh, uh, interpolation, you you must use those expensive scanners that most of us don't have access to. And there so are thank you very also, much. and there are <laughs> also issues, for instance, um, on RBG and RBGG. For instance, uh, you'll have pixels that have one red, one blue, and two green. The green responses will be uh in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum will be slightly different in their peak response and uh the reason for this uh it, it's especially noticeable in trying to pick up uh you know browns for instance so i yes i encourage you if you really want to do a good job you know you need to get more into the hardware and understand uh, the hardware's capabilities and uh, specifications. But I, I agree with you that, you know, much of this is very expensive if you're looking at a $4,000 scanner and that, you know, there are statistical techniques where you uh, can do with a, a, a less capable scanner and you're basically working on a statistical technique basis. But, you know, there are issues, for instance, you start doing, what are you really getting doing 1200 DPI when you're doing a JPEG file, you know? Uh, so people need to under, I think people need to understand some of these basic issues, but I agree with you, uh, Darren, that, uh, you know, the pragmatics of the cost of the scanner and there are statistical techniques that you can incorporate uh, to on your exemplars. If you, if I'm using the word correctly, I don't know, but I, I understand. Just reference, you reference. I, I agree material. with that. Can I? Can I just? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. finish the Dale, do you say, have any resource? I'm sorry, Paul. Dale, if you have any resources or articles that we could uh, share with the group, I think that would be very, very helpful. Well, what I'm doing, and I've been working on it for a couple of years for the Collectors Club of San Francisco, um, I'm preparing a presentation on color. You know, what is color? And the very fundamentals of color are it's an interpretation of a measurement of a quantum. And one of the issues is that you cannot make uh, measurements, but what you can do is collect information about the uh, reaction of a quantum with uh, like a photoelectric detector, and then you record that. Uh, I am preparing uh, a, a detailed presentation on it, but because of medical issues and health issues, it's going to be this year or next year, I don't know, but I have a lot of notes on that, but they're unorganized, but I am working on that presentation. Oh, terrific. And you brought up a good point. The analytical for uh, philately group is having their um, their symposium, I think it is, in October on the 10th and the 17th. Is that right, Darren? Did I get those dates? Yeah, right? at uh, 
at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, it's a two. I think there's two consecutive Tuesdays at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 uh, a.m. Pacific. Yeah, that that group, as I understand it, is basically an applied research and development group. Uh, they look at existing hardware and how you can exploit it. You know, there's the issue of peer research and development and uh, looking at establishing specifications of what you need. Uh, certainly that group does an excellent job at, at looking at existing hardware and how it can be best exploited. Paul, you were going to say something. Just, just going to finish off the subject of the, the penny um, red of Great Britain. You don't need to look at compare the colors because what you're what you're measuring is the spacing of the letter in each of the two lower two corners. They were hand punched. Everyone's different. Some of them small differences, some of them big differences. Yeah. And talking about reference copies, the imprimatur sheets held by the Postal Museum in London have, have all been scanned and are available. So the missing imprimatas, the ones that were cut out and presented to uh, important people, are the ones that give you the problem. But they're yeah. relatively few compared to the 240 stamps per sheet. So you know what's really cool? Thanks, and Paul. just a Thanks, technical Dale. note, everybody has now received an invitation to come over as a panelist. Uh, if if you want to come over and you're still an attendee, please raise your hand and I'll shoot you over. And if you are still an attendee, which you don't want to talk to people, you you don't want to be seen, you could still, um, you're unmuted, so you could still chime in verbally. I do want to reemphasize a couple of things. We have a broad um, uh, interest group uh, in attendance today. <clears throat> And uh, from the most uh, from non philatelists to people who are in postal history to people that are in dots and scratches or people that are very highly technical. I think I am not an expert in any of this. I'm just an enthusiast who is using Zoom and my uh, uh, societies to uh, as, as ways to exploit uh, the things that interest me so that I can collaborate with other people so that I can learn more. So I, I really want to emphasize, I am not an expert, uh, such as uh, those that have just spoken um, before me just a moment ago uh, on color, for example, or um, on scanners. But what I what I what I would say that I'm expert in is communicating and getting people enthused. I'm I'm basically like a uh, um, uh, I, I just want to get people excited about the hobby let them know that they can do things at home they didn't think was possible and really that's the key to this talk all right if i may jump in uh just have a, a quick question about color comparisons based upon scanners is there something like a color color cal calibration strip that could be laid alongside every item that was being scanned that would help the scanner uh, device to uh, mm. adjust yeah. its its color so that direct comparisons could be made. That would be a cool thing to market and sell. OK. <laughs> Actually, if I could speak up, the, I, I've been involved in medical research, and we do uh, color scanning on skin samples, et cetera. And uh, we do use a color comparison. And, uh, you know, that works very well for regulatory purposes. The, the, the issue I had, uh, Darren, we spoke last year at CapEx briefly about color. And when I got back and started working on that, I realized with a stamp that's so small, where do you focus on the color? Because the color is spread all over the stamp. And so how do you get an accurate, you can get RGB and all these other things, but it all comes down to where you're doing the measurement. And so that's a very nice scientific question for digital philatelists to, uh, to, to debate. Fred, it's interesting you bring that up because it is really the law of diminishing returns. 
you could it's it's like golf in a handicap you can go from a 30 handicap to a 20 pretty easily but to go from 20 to 5 and then from 5 to scratch is it's it's like this is like this hyperbola you can never reach and 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 the thing is is you have you have to have more effort more money more expenditure more commitment to get to that thing that is still not even perfect and and so it's, it's where is that happy endpoint and are you using this to um like for example i would say that i use the the scanner to help identify clusters of stamps so that my eyes don't go i don't get a migraine headache so i'll basically scan a bunch scan a bunch of stamps and look at the look at the scan and then identify stamps from color from different things um and to help me sort it's a way of sorting as opposed to a way of of um it's, it's another tool for me um uh, is is using digital techniques to help me sort as opposed to using a digital technique to help me classify right. very different yeah in, uh, in part in in regard to what fred said in terms of samples you will see a lot of articles in various philatelic publications where people are using uh, various uh, spectroscopy techniques where they take a small sample and they get a very good digital uh, curves. So there are people working in what you could call the point problem of just a piece of color. Well, I, I think what Darren's trying to focus on and what we were talking about was something that the average guy could use with a, a, a relatively cheap scanner to identify like the different shades of the uh, King George the Fifth Admirals, for example, you know, where, where you could come down with something. I, gee, I got something that's on the borderline. Can I really define that with some digital thing and not get into, you know, spots and and yeah, other... so it all depends on what you want to do with your collection. Are you looking for cancels? Are you looking at paper? I, I've been able to identify really cool things with scans. Uh, I've identified a couple new papers that have never been described before, simply because of, of, of my scanning techniques. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's really interesting. It, 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 it is a, um, uh, there is a plethora of opportunity um, and you can take it wherever you wanna go. Really this was to, ins it's to inspire people yeah. and, and to collaborate. And there is no right or wrong. Tony Ward, you've been waiting for a, while. a second. I, I had a, a question on a different topic, um, and one you touched on but didn't really elaborate on, and that was of, about maps. Um, I'm very interested in mapping routes and rates uh, and being able to uh, produce in an exhibit um, a, a good map which only shows information that I want, it, want to show I've played around with Google Maps and programming that, uh, and I'm extremely frustrated. I wonder whether you, you mentioned Dave Hobden, I, I think was the name. Yeah, he's in Milton, Ontario. Um, and I can, you can, I'll give you my email address and you can send me an email and I'll, I'll connect the two of you together and he can give you some uh, uh, tools, it's especially how to uh, go and, and find digital archives. And that's what you're really looking for, looking for. It's not what Google wants. Google's only putting stuff in there that's based on contemporary stuff. You're looking, you're you're wanting to look at digital archives, how the world was viewed and how the world was mapped back in in the in 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 the, in the time that you're in the period that you're studying. Uh, my email address is is I'll just give you my professional email address. It's info i n f o at yellowfever.ca. It's the one I'm using right now. So it's uh, short for uh, information. So it's info at yellowfever.ca. That'll get to me. It's not my hobby email, but I, it's easier to tell over the uh, uh, verbally that email than the, the other one. So it's all good. Thank you. Darren, it might be nice to share that with the whole group, all those um, historical research uh, sources. So that, well, then you should all become members of the British North America Philatelic Society. Be a member of my of my. And this is a plug for BNAPS. Uh, but we have we are probably the of all the philatelic societies in the world. We have probably the strongest study group and research oriented group, other than maybe the one 
that our fellow uh, from England uh, has. But I can tell you that from a study group perspective, we have a plethora of groups with, uh, it's, it's a, fin you don't have to collect Canadian stamps to be a member of BNAPS to get stuff out of it. So uh, yes, um, Joan, just send me a request and I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, things that you can. Um, I would like to mention for an item of information for everyone, an absolute excellent resource of uh, old maps is the David Rumsey uh, map collection at Stanford University. You can download uh, almost any map they have at extremely high resolution. They even uh, offer a georeferencing capability where you can hmm. compare two maps. And uh, for instance, you got a little mountain on one map at a location and a, another map showing the same map, you know, there could be differences on the placement. So they have excellent analytical uh, tools, uh, David Rumsey also uh, for comparing maps. But I would strongly suggest uh, anyone having interest in maps, uh, visit the David Rumsey site. Yeah, I kind Fantastic. of, from my perspective, when I was looking for uh, maps, I could find lots of maps dating from 1890s, the period I was really interested in. Um, what I'm more interested in is being able to create a map myself showing the, the route of ships of transport across um, land, um, which is an accurate map, um, but only contains the information I want it to, uh, to contain. Are you looking, for, John, are you looking for artistic styles? He's looking for an overlay over a map, and there's a couple. Yeah. There's a couple tools that I know that we use professionally um, that the names I'll have to talk to our technical folks, but we do that with flood disasters to map that type of thing. So let me see if I could get those resources, John, and, and we'll, it's just what they do is they call it a, a layer overlay. So you, you put the map there, you usually um, tone it out so it's not so bright, and then you overlay your data points over that. that and perfect. The that's, that's exactly what I'm interested in. Yes, okay. and in regards to what you'd like to do, I would strongly suggest that you get a hold of one, uh, one of uh, Stan Payer's uh, books. Uh, all of his are related to Nevada and Nevada ghost towns. Uh, but uh, he uses a special map agent uh, and the maps in there are, I'm, I'm doing the same thing you are. I'm interested in reconstructing uh, routes. They're doing a lot of work, for instance, with LIDAR now uh, to look at the Sagebrush country and see where some of these old roads are and they're collecting data. But uh, let me see if I can, well, I don't know, this does not, but it, it's, uh, they're Stan Pears uh, books. Um, he has quite a series of them. Uh, they're published by Nevada Publications. Uh, there's a Las Vegas address here. And personally, personally, I just love the maps that he has in his. I wish I could. I'm working on trying to emulate to come up with a job like he did. But I'm, I'm like you. I'm uh, trying to get information like this LIDAR where they're collecting and the studies they're doing and uh, being able to determine uh, in terms of uh, GPS coordinates where these old stage routes that are have totally disappeared, but you can detect them and then get that information and in, uh, incorporate it into map. One of the specific routes I'm looked at is the Chico route that ran from uh, Susanville, uh, California, up through Nevada, uh, south, uh, eastern Oregon, and into the uh, country uh, gold and silver areas of Silver City, uh, Ruby. But uh, I'm blabbing on. I'm sorry. I, I would strongly suggest you look at this, at least as an example. And he gives the reference to the individual that did the maps for him. You'll find in here, for instance, they picked up the railroad routes the rail tracks, and they've put them in here. They've picked up old stage routes and put them in here. 
I wish I could do as good a job as he did. Tony Ward, you have had your hand up and you've been so patient. Thank you so much for a couple of a couple of thoughts. Thanks, John. First of all, with the colors, um, it was always difficult to be able to get the same color comparison. And at one stage, a friend and I, we were at a distance, we sent each other some small color cards, like as in the, the painting ones, the ones for paints that you get from the hardware shop. Um, because, and we, I went into the hardware shop and I got several of them and then I sent one to each person. So at least they were from the same printing and they would be the same gray. I, I would have preferred to have used a Kodak grayscale um, card because I think there's a bit more to keeping those to being the same. But then once you've matched the grayscale of the, the card, hopefully the rest of the, the colors come out to be the same. But with the scanning, I think it would be really good if there could, everybody, there's a whole stack of people all scanning, they're scanning the images they do, et cetera. It'd be really nice if there could be everyone say, you know, scan at 300, scan at 600. Um, it'd be nice to do them all as TIFFs, but of course we haven't got enough space and storage space if you're an ardent scanner to be able to do it as so it's lossless. Um, you know what what should we be scanning at what 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 is the best method for doing that i don't think there i'm not going to answer it specifically but i think you scan based on what you have available and what you you want the scan to do it's like computer software um if you um for example, I buy my computer based on the software that I'm using. I don't buy a computer and then buy the software. Um, and 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 the same thing as it, when it relates to scanning. What am I what am I trying to achieve? What is my goal? Um, am I scanning to do perforations? Am I scanning for color? Am I scanning for plate varieties? Am I scanning to have a census? Am I scanning to have a digital record of my stamps? for insurance purposes. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why you scan things. And so I think once you know what your question is, then you can, your your technique will be, will, will, your, your, will, will be related. How you, how you scan will determine what, what your endpoint is. I think you find, find out what your endpoint is first and then work backwards, uh, as opposed to, you know, using really high tech stuff. And then all of a sudden you flood your, uh your your uh, if you're doing nothing but high-end scans uh for insurance purposes you're going to have uh 85 gigabytes of material that will be very difficult for insurance agent to look at so uh that's a that's a simple example but i i hope is, does that really address your your question duncan it's, it's a very non-specific answer yes i was i was thinking that we need to have yes you, you can as high as possible um as you can, I guess, but some scanners, I guess they overscan. Is that a good way of putting it? Uh, we're all we're all restricted in what what you know our financial capacity is for our hardware. Well, let me give you an example. Um, a friend of mine, Ken Pugh, is one of the world's leading experts in stamp forgeries. Ken's books are wonderful with incredible illustrations. All his illustrations are at 300 DPI. Some of them are at 1200, but they're almost all at 300. And you will not believe that his large um, images are, are at that DPI. So the, 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 the point is, is if you, if you are wanting to compare things, then you have to use the same of everything to compare. If you want to share information, well, that's different. You could just share however you want. Um, but if you want to uh, compare <laughs> your stamps with someone else's, that becomes the trickier question. And, and then people have to basically almost get together in the same room using the same techniques with the same computer and the same setup and the same scanner to, uh, you know, or have someone send you their stamps that you can scan the same way you do that's the way you could really make a good comparison. Even then, you're 
you know, you might, you might, then your, 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 your precision is good, but then are you accurate? You may be completely inaccurate. It's like darts, you know, in terms of precision and accuracy, we're talking about two different things. If you have three darts that are over the triple 20, but you're aiming for the bullseye, you're a very precise dart thrower, but you're not accurate at all. And so if you're doing the same thing all the time, we want precision when we're comparing and collaborating. Accuracy is only important if we are using it as the gold standard reference. Um, and so, and then accuracy and precision comes with that $4,000 scanner. I think that's a pretty, I've never answered it that way before, but I think that's a good answer. This is also another, another question. In the old days, you would occasionally see, particularly for the engraved stamps, you would see where there was a stamp with a lot of different plate varieties, you would see a gray image on a page. And yep. then, then on that gray image, there would be little marks, little colored marks or marks all over it so that you had an immediate reference. When you looked at your stamp, you could see, oh, there's a little mark there near the queen's nose or whatever. And you say, right, yes, that's at row three, number seven or whatever. And those in the old days, they must have been done by a lot of artwork and, and people drawing little lines on grayed out images, etc. There, there are that would be quite a good if there was an easy way of doing that for the stamps which have a lot of small plate varieties. It could become a good illustrative tool. Are you asking? Is there a technique in which you can create your own? Yes, easily. Okay. Are you? Is it a question or a rhetorical one that you actually have the your way of doing it? No, I don't have my way of doing it. Okay. I, mean, I have so my that, way of, of, of thinking of doing it, but I don't want to have something which has thousands or not thousands, but many, many layers within many, many layers. Um, I can, I can, I, I think it's a great question and it is completely worthy is, of a article that I would like to uh, write and publish. Yes, I will please. use your question, Tony, as a challenge question. Uh, if you could send me an email, please, if, if, if you had a chance to write down my email, please send me your question and I will create within the next 12 months an article for publication on that specific question. I will send you a scan of at least uh, one or two of ones that have been done. And I, I have examples myself. All oh, right, right. I just need right. the reminder. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and, uh, Tony, and I will before I publish it, Tony, I will send it back for you for your editing. <laughs> so if you miss Darren's uh, email address, you're welcome to send it to the British Empire. We'll forward it on to him. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hey, you know, I have a question. Uh, if I if I have to leave, my wife just nudged me. I have dinner coming up. Uh, it is uh, almost five o'clock, and that's her dinner time uh, in the on the West Coast. Um, I do want to say that. Uh, and I, and I, I'm going to do screenshots of the question answers. There's six of them, which I will um, look at later and do my yeah. best to answer them. But if you can all go to the chat and on the very bottom right, when you click open chat, there's three little dots. Left click those three little dots and save chat and it'll save it to your to your computer. There are some really, really good. Inf there's really good information in there, folks, uh, from the. Um, uh, from the audience, I'm really I've learned a lot just by flipping through these uh, um, uh, 90 or so uh, uh, chats. So please go to your open the chat, go to the bottom right hand corner to those three little dots, left click it and then left left click the save chat. And you've got that as a transcript. Yeah, we'll get it out to them, Darren, and we'll also get you the questions. Do you, do you have just time for Peter, who's had who's been very patient? Yep. Peter? Yeah, you're talking about uh, digital philatelic, and most of the time that is websites. Um, but most of the website that I like to use, uh, for instance, Claire Corn's forgery website, has been all offline for the last 10 years. There is another one, but it is dead. Um, and there are a lot of other um, websites that have gone dead as well, uh, the dreaded 404 uh, notice. Um, isn't there a way that we could make uh, websites more permanent 
because um, there is a lot of work done um, and we have seen a lot of websites, but usually there are a few people that carry the work and care for the website. And if they are gone, the website dies because there is no more payment and it is gone. So digital philately, yes, but it is dying as fast as it grows. Can Peter, you do this something is great, about this is this is a great concern to such a degree that the British North American Philatelic Society is now looking at what private websites are considered and the, the, the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada is doing the same thing, looking at what websites are important enough that they become part of the that 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 ownership of that website in terms of its information, not necessarily maintaining the site, but is transferred to the society. Mm -hmm. uh, so a private site then becomes curated by or, or maintained or 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 um, archived um, the pages themselves for example it doesn't have to be the whole site it could just be pdfs of of each page and 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 a site map that helps helps you look at it we have actually looked at this uh, uh issue uh over the last couple of years and and peter if you have my email i would love to discuss with you uh ideas that we can share and 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 then uh, have other uh um societies collaborate on this issue so that we come up with really good ways of of i'm not too worried about society websites i'm more uh and i think you're relating to private individuals who have no, no, inspired no. us to do <clears throat> a certain thing so so for example, as well societies as well societies as well I, i'm a member yeah. of a few specialist societies and when we have a meeting like this there are seven people and all 70 plus so yeah. i'm the youngest then then you have a challenge you need to um you, you need to send me an email and let's let's think about something because this well, is a very yeah. important arm of digital philately uh and i think it's a critical arm that that needs to be addressed uh, I'm addressing it. I'm trying to get, um, I'm having a, a reference library for Latin America and the Middle East, including used abroad. Um, and I'm talking to members of my officina to have one website where all digital publications can be stored. Uh, because there are loads and loads of information. Um, myself, I think I have 20,000 journals, uh, issues of journals. and a load of information but most of those sites might yeah might end up going uh, down or i have heard for some they are paying a lot of money but they don't get a value um and i'm trying to get people interested to have one um yeah reference library or digital archive for philatelic uh, publications i know there are publications at <clears throat> american universities and they are under Haiti Trust, um, Americans can view them. I can't. I can only have pages from them, but I cannot download all uh, the complete uh, journal. But they are, I know they are there. Uh, so I would think they should be shared with the APRL or somewhere where they would be safer. But it is a concern. It's a very valid concern, has very layers, various layers of complexity and barriers, um, including legal barriers, copyright barriers, um, and uh, ownership barriers. Uh, there would, I, I almost would think, in order to do this correctly at the massive scale that you're suggesting, uh, that a, a separate society called, mm. you know, some type of um, philatelic preservation society or something that could be um uh managed uh by all the major so uh, philatelic societies in the world so it would be um a not just uh, a shared branch that they but could actually then overcome a lot of the copyright issues the um the legacy component that you describe so <clears throat> this is i think a very worthy uh question that needs to be raised by all the major philatelic societies in the world and then uh at maybe one of the major um uh um uh, uh philatelic 
uh, exhibitions, uh, that this is a separate uh, um, uh, a meeting just on this alone, uh, followed by a round table um, um, board meeting type of, of uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 spearhead some type of, 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 of So, of so Darren, I know forward. you have to go. So let's try to get through the round of questioning before your wife uh, mm -hmm. Okay. May, I, may, I add, may I add one thing more? It should also include auction houses because a lot of auction houses have digital versions of their auction catalogs online. But I'm also not sure whether they will stay there. And also, I would like to invite uh, publishers, Stanley Gibbons, Michael, Iver, uh, because they might also have an, some use for it. Absolutely. Um, and uh, there are uh, uh, different societies in the world that actually um, uh, do that already. So that's something we can definitely talk about as well. But auction sites are, are a very, very important uh, uh, um, source of information. Uh, one of the questions, any suggestions for a substitute retro reveal? Uh, retro reveal does exist, and I believe it was answered in the chat. So if you go, um, Piyush, into the chat, uh, there is a new link that you can find uh, to look at Retro Reveal. That's hey, that one. Duncan, you have a question. I have an anecdote. Uh, okay. Cover arrived on Tuesday, scanned it, sent it off to the author of the handbook on British Postal Stationery. Uh, and he said, ah, yes, this is a later printing than has ever been seen before um 1879 so there are still discoveries to be made in very old things mm -hmm. and i know you'll find them because you have like <laughs> such such uh detailed knowledge of everything you always impress me so jerry yeah you know, darren i'm trying to move people along so your wife <laughs> <laughs> yeah very, very quickly it's not a question it's a comment in response to Peter Moore's question about not being able to find uh, websites uh, anymore, uh, several years ago, and I forget how many, I discovered uh, a, 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 a program or a website or something called Wayback Machine, and, and I forget how it works. But if you get if you have some information about uh, a particular website that's no longer seems to be active, uh, it it can it can bring stuff back for you again yeah, there's also some dark websites which you know i don't advise yeah but, called, <laughs> i think i think it's called wayback machine and i was able you to, know what jerry it's probably like google or something like that that actually collects information about pages and then maybe has a screenshot that that when they search for it then you could actually access the screenshots rather than an active site yeah i i used it one time when i was trying to because i I used a, a, a website uh, uh, from Italy, uh, called, I think it was called, here you can identify stamps or whatnot, and they seemed to go down. The the, the authors weren't uh, keeping up to date, but I was able to, to find a link to that using this Wayback Machine. Again, I do not remember how it worked and how hard it was to get the stuff, but I was able to resurrect that one site. Anyway. Darren, excellent presentation. Thanks, Jerry. Giles, you're you're here. Thank you very much, Jerry, for that. Yeah, uh, Darren, uh, just uh, to answer the question uh, from that Peter raised earlier, I recall uh, starting that conversation maybe a year ago on some other forum. Uh, what I think could be an, a temporary alternative is that a lot of those websites, the work that individual people do, uh, they also belong to a study group. And they use that to contribute to the study group. So uh, maybe those the people who have such a such, such website could simply uh, make it available to the study group because generally study group uh, survive people. I look at a place like a great group like Maple Leaf, for example, from the uh, uh, Philatelic Society of Great Britain, or you look at BNAP, so Royal Philatelic Society. They have a lot of uh, history dating back from the start. And this has always been maintained, so it survived the various editor, the various chair, and the information is always there. So using this model, uh, I, I, I'll always refer to, uh, there's a great site, for example, 
uh, on re-entries from Ralph Trimble. Eventually, uh, I think that information is so valuable for a lot of us that we don't want that to be lost. But there is a study group on re-entries. So perhaps just providing the link and let the re-entry subgroup continue to manage that will be a way, at least in the interim, to make sure that uh, the perennity of that information remains until a better solution is found. Thanks, Jill. It sounds like we need to get a bunch of people together and come up with a program, get some funding for it, and just try to make it happen with mm. some of the organizations like the Smithsonian, and, you know, people with deeper pockets and a little bit more longevity. Um, but um, okay. Well, it sounds like I inspired the, the audience. Woohoo! <laughs> I'd say so. Yes, thank Many, you, Darren. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. So, Darren, we'll, what we'll try to do is put together a list of all the resources so that people could have them. Um, and I'll talk to you and we'll coordinate. I'll get you the questions, the questions in the chat, which was fantastic. We'll get those um, out to everybody. And the, the whole purpose is to share the information and try not to, you know. Yeah. I think I think the other thing is 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 keep in mind when people ask questions, I'm going to help hold them to account, and I may ask them to make a presentation uh, as part of uh, a guest speaker in in our in our study group uh, uh, Zoom session. So so there is there is uh, I I will get you involved. So these are not uh, these are uh, these are two way questions. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I want to thank everybody for your your time and and uh, and energy. And it sounds like there's just as many enthusiastic philatelists as there as I am. So uh, thank you again. And uh, it was a real pr a privilege to be able to speak um, for the study club. Thank you. Wonderful and, uh, presentation. You. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.